I can feel the knowledge growing. Knowledge expansion pack It came to me in a dream, you know. It just happens. Nah, dude. <laughs> For me, man, I'm just like, uh, I'm just like, okay, you learn something new every day. Learn no more than what I learned yesterday. You know what I mean? <laughs> but nothing new at all. I mean, like, just new experiences. But like, overall, like, brain as to like what I'm learning and stuff. No, not really. I mean, I finally finished Matthew, so I'm like really happy about that. You know, now I'm going back into Genesis, which. I'm kind of dreading, honestly. <laughs> well, honest. hey, no, no, no. <laughs> hang on now. What? Whoa, whoa, whoa. What's wrong with Genesis, sir? Nothing's wrong with Genesis. I think it's just always that, like, you know, when you're starting something new, it's always hard to get into the habit of. Sure. Yeah, that's how I feel. Like, I'm just losing all motivation to, like, read. That's that's where I'm at. Like, genuinely, I'm like, I'm like, I've read the whole Bible for, like, the third time. Time to go back. And I'm like, I should probably take a, like a small mental break, maybe a day or two before I visit this subject. But then I'm like, nah, I need it. <laughs> so I actually just wrapped up Matthew myself in my my reading plan because I've been I've been burning, bro. I've been burning those those minor prophets are a lot more minor than I actually thought. So it didn't take no. me as long to get through them as I thought. So I was able to wrap that up last week, and now I wrapped up Matthew. I think over the last weekend into early this week. What's what's a major takeaway that you got from reading the book? Um, it's what I said last week, where it's like Romans states that like Jesus's people, like basically, uh, what is it? They rejected him. So therefore, because of that rejection, it was then offered to the Gentiles. You know, and so you just kind of see these small interactions of like Jesus having interactions with his Pharisees, and you kind of see the what is it you kind of see the correlation now what i've learned this week is actually kind of cool because it kind of relates to today's topic you know i was looking at two different people in the bible towards the end of the chapter since i was like taking because remember what i told you bro i was looking into context but on top of that like i was diving into commentaries listening to podcasts like the whole weeks that i was in matthew everything was constantly like i want to know the biblical context i want to know the spiritual context i wanted to know like I wanted to basically go down a deep rabbit hole with each of these chapters. And we've talked about this before over lunch. And so I think what's really cool and something that I've kind of noticed is how like religiousness and evil politicians kind of go hand in hand, you know? So I was looking at like Pilate's character, you know? And like in Matthew, at least, um, you kind of see that his wife has a dream about Jesus. And she kind of says to his husband, to Pilate, which is, her husband she says like hey have nothing to do with that guy because like i had a terrible dream that he was going to do something right so then from there like pilot kind of plays the idiot rule like kind of plays an idiot like not gonna lie he kind of plays like a dummy because he's like oh it's your guys's customary tradition to let you know one of your people go free barabbas or jesus you know Deep down, he looked at the evidence and knew Jesus wasn't guilty. You know, he knew Jesus wasn't guilty. And yet he played dumb and said, oh, like, you know, uh, like, I'm going to let the people decide. Even though I know Jesus isn't guilty and he should be the one let free, I'm going to let the people decide so that way it doesn't, like, you know, make me look bad. It makes them look bad, you know? And so, at least for me, man, like, just reading that and just seeing how, like, how, like, Pilate, in a way, like, puts on this posture right does it for the pharisees and in the end like he he kind of reaps what he sows why because uh if you like the bible doesn't say it but if you actually look into history what happens after uh he ends it he ends up getting uh not only uh what is it exiled from his from the roman government and everything like exiled from his positions also leads him through an area where he ends up committing suicide which i never actually knew and it wasn't even that long until after like Jesus was crucified. So I just thought it was like very, very interesting. Or like the fact that like Matthew kind of makes this small detail on um, a lie, basically, where um, one of the centurions who was like basically protecting Jesus's tomb because the Pharisees were afraid 
uh, that, what is it, that the disciples were going to come in and try to steal Jesus' body to basically say, oh, he's risen, you know? So they mm -hmm. put a to kind of keep watch. The guard basically sees everything, you know, sees the resurrection of Jesus, sees the boulder being moved, you know, Jesus comes back to life. He sees everything, goes to the, I want to say the Roman government or maybe the Pharisees. I need to go check that again. But basically, he goes to some level of authority, and the level of authority basically says, oh, yeah, lie. Say that, like, his disciples came in the midst of the night and uh, tell him that, uh, what is it? Tell him that, that they he's stole his body. Yeah, that someone stole his body, basically. And like I said, just goes to show that, like, you know, corrupt politicians are also part of, like, the Old Testament, you know, like. I think it's those small details that we as people tend to forget when we read the Bible. It's like, well, there's so much information packed into this book that we tend to forget the small details or even the small things of like, you know, what truly shows his existence or even how, how like a small white lie or just a small detail can change everything for people, you know? But it's also expected too, right? So, I mean, none of that was a surprise to God, right? The, the vision, obviously, that his wife had, that Pilate's wife had was not a surprise. It was not an accident. It was all... Uh, contributing towards God's ultimate purpose for having G Jesus be the sacrifice for sin on the cross. So ultimately, uh, the bigger picture does carry the day and it becomes a lot less sad than it might otherwise appear to be. But I didn't know that about Pilate. I mean, it would it would make sense, I suppose. I mean, that's a, it's a tough decision. You know, it's always hard, especially for leaders. I mean, whether you're religious or not, to have to punish somebody for something that you know they didn't do. So can't imagine what it's like for him at that point in time he's like you're about to execute a guy who never did anything wrong per se i suppose i mean if you're a jewish person or if you're a jewish leader at that time obviously uh, he you would believe that jesus was blaspheming and identifying to have a position of authority of deity that he didn't have from their perspective of course so I suppose it makes sense in a sense, but Pilate doesn't really adhere to the Jewish religion. So for him, he's like, guys, what am I, what am I doing here? But I mean, I suppose I, I have to give you this option. So make the choice for yourselves. And I mean, that does certainly weigh on, on leaders and that's one of the costs of leadership, right? <laughs> Especially when your, your position of leadership is set up heavily around the perspectives of other people and you don't really have you have some sort of authority to make decisions, but ultimately your decisions are going to be scrutinized by the people who those decisions impact. So, I mean, he could have practically, this is, this wasn't going to happen, but he practically could have said something like, yeah, no, I, I don't really see any evidence that, that this guy is worthy of being executed and not put him up for execution, but that wasn't going to happen. And, uh, but it is certainly interesting to see how that impacts people from a practical perspective. I think one of the things that I found was interesting about the book of Matthew is, uh, right after, right after, I suppose in quotes, the uh, Sermon on the Mount, where you see the first instance with the disciples in the boat. That's a very interesting story to me. Um, yeah. Before I get into that, I have a, an interesting perspective on that. Actually, what do you, what do you kind of, what do you personally take away from that experience that the disciples had on the boat initially with Jesus before that storm happened, and then you know Jesus did the whole thing of like <laughs> being God and quelling that storm at least for me man like i think of like how like we as people when it comes to like uh what is it when it comes to like personal turmoil we tend to focus more on the storm and less on just being present in the moment and the way the reason why i say that is because i i experienced this literally like six months ago for anybody who doesn't know, me and me and Chris are grad students. So I'm currently getting a master's in, bi in biochemistry. So um, I'm taking, uh, I took a course called basically college level organic chemistry, which was probably one of the hardest classes I've ever taken in my entire life. It was basically an exam. If anybody's taken anatomy, it's almost the same level of intensity as those courses. And specifically at UC Denver, where they basically cram it into one semester just for everybody to get context. And literally, we were 11 students starting out, and we ended up dropping down to only four, four of us finishing the course. And uh, that was super scary, even for me, because I was constantly almost failing every single exam, but getting C's on every single homework. And when I prayed, I was like, Lord, just give me the peace. Give me the understanding. Cause this is a crazy storm, you know, like, like, like literally I'm watching my grade go from an A to like basically an F 
day by day, week after week, trying really hard, pouring all my heart into it. And I just wasn't seeing God anywhere. You know what I mean? And so like, literally, I just felt like I kept asking the Lord, like, please calm my heart. Please trust. Like, I trust you over this grade. Like, if I have to fail this course, so be it. Because I want, I just want to know that like, you can calm the storm inside of me. And just like, let me see the light and just let me enjoy the peace that like comes with it. And so literally, like, I, I literally feel like, like Peter in this story where he's like, you know, Hey, like, wake up, buddy. Like, I need you to like, calm. you know, I need you to like, wake up so you can like reassure me. And the Lord was like, was just telling me like, Hey, like, it's okay. You know, you have little faith. Why are you so afraid? And I think deep down, like, like, first off, like, I think like when he means by little faith, I don't think he means like. I don't think he means by portion size, if that makes sense. Like, for example, because like in another area of the Bible, it says that if we have faith the size of a mustard seed, we can move mountains, right? So mm -hmm. I would say the English version of this is kind of uh, like misleading. I would say what he means by little faith, I think by time duration. Does that make sense? Hmm. And the reason explain why I a little think, bit more. Yeah, this is where I'm going to explain. So let's look back. So let's go. I want to say this is the story where Peter walks on water. I want to say this is where it happens, but I don't know. So mm -hmm. don't quote me on that. <laughs> but like, basically, <laughs> if we look at the story at where Peter walks on water, he literally has the faith to go, Jesus, like, if this is really you, help me walk on water. And he takes a few steps. He takes a few steps. And then when he looks away from Jesus, literally, he starts sinking, you know? And Jesus says almost this exact same thing where he goes, oh, like, you know, where he says, you have little faith. Why did you, why did you doubt? And so I don't like, you know, Literally, I would assume that Peter had like a crap ton of faith. Don't you think like, like to be able to walk on water? That's pretty impressive. In my opinion, at least, you know, mm -hmm. that's pretty impressive. But yet, like, I don't think he said little faith as in portion size. I think he genuinely meant like the moment he doubt or moment cr doubt creeped into his life, his time duration of faith started to dwindle because I think in his head, he was like, I shouldn't be able to do this. It's kind of funny that you brought in the fact that you're going to read Genesis after reading Matthew, because there's a very interesting tie here in this little section of scripture that I don't think most people realize. Uh, if you think back to Genesis one, right, the first four or so verses of the entire Bible, uh, you get a picture of God's creative power and, and what that looks like. And in the first four verses, obviously, you see the first verse where it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Then you get verse two, where it says, and the earth was formless and, and void and darkness was over the surface of the deep or something like that. And the spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And then in verse three, you get God said, let there be light. And then I think it's verse four where you see God separate the light from the darkness. And this is interesting, right? Because when we jump now back to Matthew chapter eight, and we see the picture of the storm, right? We see mm -hmm. a very similar image. We see sort of that chaotic surrounding, right? And when things don't seem to be the way that they should, uh, God is there and Jesus is there and he's, he's peaceful in the midst of the storm. It's a very interesting little picture and, and tie there that you see between Genesis one and Matthew eight. So for me, when I'm looking at that, I'm immediately drawn to the fact that, you know, First and foremost, Jesus is actually God. And you see these little moments throughout scripture that do point to the fact that he is indeed uh, the God that he claimed to be. Uh, but number two, you start to see, well, hang on a second. When there is the storm, right, and I don't see Jesus, that doesn't mean he's not there. And not only does it mean he's not there, or not only does it not mean that he's not there, he is there and he's he's a source of, of that peace that you're talking about. And all we have to do is find him in the midst of that and not worry from our perspective about, Hmm, how am I going to escape this situation? Like, I think our, our, our human minds are inclined to seeing circumstances from the sort of reactionary perspective, like, right? Like, how am I going to make sure that this circumstance ends the way that I think is optimal or, or best for me? Right. And my survival and, and my well-being and in the midst of it, all you got to do is really look to Jesus and say, hey, you know, your will be done. And and I'm here for it. Let me find you. Where are you in the midst of this storm? Because I know you're there and I know you're a source of peace. You know, well, the, the issue of peace, that's actually another issue I wanted to pick your mind on real quick, because there is that obvious spiritual peace that that God has given us through Jesus and the Holy Spirit. But. I'm interested to see how you sort of reconcile the the different 
pieces pieces like p e a c e s ah, i know that that we see in the gospels even because obviously oh, i don't remember exactly what chapter it is in matthew it, it might be 14 or 15 somewhere around there uh where jesus very clearly says is like I did not come to bring peace. I came to bring a sword. But then in John 14, you see, hey, my peace I leave with you. So it seems like that peace that he brings is not a circumstantial peace. It is a spiritual peace that transcends uh, throughout circumstances. And that's where our focus should be on, on the divine element, on the ultimate element of the peace uh, that is to be attained. But I'm kind of interested. How do you kind of reconcile those two the the practical piece that jesus did not come to bring circumstantially but the spiritual piece that he did bring us honestly like this is this is a hot take i'm not gonna lie this is like even for me i was like ouch this is kind of a terrible take but um like the way we see peace is not the same that god sees peace does it make sense sure like for example like you can think of the most pe peaceful place i think of denver you know the trees the woods you know you know, like, you know, like, like think of a forest, you know, like cause we're in Denver, there are beautiful mountains and everything. And I, and I see just a beautiful waterfall, you know, truly streams and everything, you know. And I believe that like genuinely when it comes to like practically peace, like you can almost find chaos if you put your focus on it genuinely. Like let's, 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 let's take a forest, for example, you know, you think of like, you know, like just these trees, beautiful streams right if you're looking for a peaceful environment but then if you're trying to look the look for the chaos in that environment you think of a bear just coming out of somewhere and just basically ruining your day a bear's probably killing fishes you know there's probably blood massacres you know fish are probably eating other fish you know if you're choosing to focus on it and I, I think it's just um it's just one of those things when it comes to like being having peace beyond all understanding i think it just goes back to like setting our eyes on the lord why? Because like he's the king of peace, you know, it's what uh, I think Matthew 14, 28 or something somewhere in the 20s. But I don't remember uh, where in Matthew. I just know it's in Matthew where he goes, take upon my yoke because it's easy, you know, take about my yeah. bur burdens. Don't worry about tomorrow for tomorrow has its own worries. Focus on today, you know. And so like um, when it comes to like peace, I genuinely think it's the the ability to like stay in the present moment focus on what today has has for you and not focusing uh about like tomorrow i think of singleness today man i kid you not man that that book has brought me so much peace because it's not a book about singleness it uses singleness as a practical aspect but i also think that like you know that a lot of the things that are talking about is being able to like let go of your past problems but also not focusing too much on falling into the trap of focusing on what tomorrow has planned but genuinely just focusing on what today has to offer you know because i feel like genuinely like uh ryan weckman says this in his book and i think it's the last chapter of his tomorrow book of his tomorrow chapter where he says he had like an out-of-body experience and he literally goes to the mountains and literally has this great experience with the Lord, you know, truly amazing experience, but he has this out of body experience and he's like kind of watching himself, like waste his time away, writing basic journaling, a kind of like a toddler change from to the Lord. And in his head, he's like, what am I doing? You know, he literally says, what am I doing? I'm in a place where there's so much beauty. There's so much wonder, you know, there's so much wonder what are you doing my guy like get off the freaking like <laughs> get off the journal like start focusing on today and i think genuinely like that's how we people struggle when it comes to finding peace it's just we tend to like lose our ability to act like a child you know even even jesus says like those who come to the kingdom come with a childlike faith right and i think part of that comes with the wonder you know part of that like yes to find peace i think it's genuinely just finding content in where you're at now and being okay with where you're at you know both in the practical aspect but also in the spiritual aspect because i feel like they have to go hand in hand and that's um easier said than done easier said than done because practically i could be thinking about this over here like my job my my kids my family but but like these certain levels and spiritually i can be like lord Give me peace because I need peace beyond understanding because of all this crap that's going through my head. I need this peace. And like, and I feel like God's just being like, bro, where are you grateful? You know, where's, where's the gift? Like the sun goes up every day. And like, you know, have you seen the sunset, sunsets in Colorado these days or the Aurora Borealis that happened like two weeks ago? 
Like I didn't see that, but the sunsets are absolutely gorgeous. 100%. Yeah, they're gorgeous, but like take a step back and just soak it in. Um, something I do and, uh, John can attest to this and certain people in our, and, and I think you can attest to this. Do you know that like, there are times where like, we're having a great conversation and literally I just like sit in the silence where I just go. <sighs> You're like, do you, have you seen that for me too? Like where I just go, ah, uh, like, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And, and nobody's ever asked me this except for certain people where they go, why do you do that? It's because I want to take in this moment. I want to take in this memory of like having a good, genuine conversation with an amazing person. And that is hard, you know, because we have conversations, at least like me and you, man, we have it once a week. For sure, we have it once a week. But like for someone like who I see every day, like my coworkers, I take them for granted, you know? Sometimes we make great conversations. Other times I just, you know, I lose I lose the heart for it, you know? I'm going to expand on this a little bit because I think this is a pretty deep issue. And I think it's an issue that's a lot deeper than we conventionally think of it. Uh, as being so i think oftentimes we try to bank peace and what i mean by that is that we try to seek out circumstances that we have identified as peaceful circumstances and try to experience as much peace as we possibly can almost sort of to like charge the, the peace meter so that when we're doing life throughout the week when those instances of non-peace occur and we find ourselves in a circumstance that's pretty hectic chaotic etc uh, we can bank on that piece. And then we kind of then, by extension, act as if when the piece that we've stored out or stored up runs out, that that that's it's not attainable anymore. And I think that's mostly because we tie our piece to the circumstances that we're in, like that. We generally attribute peace to being in the mountains or being in a serene environment or being in the peace and calm of our room and and that being sort of the source of of the peace that that guides us throughout the week. And we associate that with Jesus when in reality, I think the injunction being placed on us by Jesus is even greater than than that, right? Because the world will tell you something similar. The world will tell you, hey, find where your happy place is, wherever you can attain your Zen, like, cool, be there. That's important. Recharge yourself for the week. And as per usual, if the world is saying it, it's probably wrong to an extent. And I think for us, it's it's a challenge to be in the world, but not of the world. And that involves these types of aspects. And we're talking about how do we attain peace? So when we're talking about the spiritual peace that's attained, I think that's peace that can be attained and utilized in every circumstance, whether the circumstance is peaceful or not. I think the question is, do we see Jesus in every circumstance or do we only see him in the areas that bring us serenity and bring us peace based on what we're perceiving? That's the way the world lives life. The world lives by what they see, but we are called to walk by faith, right? Like, I think that's a great Jeremy Camp song, isn't it? It's like, I I will walk by faith even when I do not see it, right? So the question isn't, for us at least, where do we find it physically? I think it's how do we find it in each of our circumstances? And that's why looking to Jesus is important. I think that's, that's a part of the the story of uh, at least Peter's story when he's wandering out onto the water and he's looking at Jesus and he takes his eyes off of Jesus that we kind of neglect. We just kind of see that and think, Oh yeah, Peter was silly. Didn't have enough faith to continue looking at Jesus. And it's like, no, that's exactly the issue. That's exactly the issue. He took his eyes off of Jesus and Huzzah, <laughs> life went back to the way life walk, wanders and operates without Jesus. And, and we end up wandering a lot more in the chaos and being grabbed by the chaos and by the circumstance when our eyes aren't focused on Jesus in every circumstance. So I don't necessarily think that when we're doing life, it's just our job to look for what we're supposed to do and focus on what we're doing for today. It's who are we focusing on when we're doing each of those things? And I mean, for example, here's a good example to, to practically put this into perspective. If, if I'm doing my job, right, I'm focusing on what my job requires me to do. But there are parts of my job that I might not necessarily enjoy doing or that might be more tiring and might impact my mental state and make me more fatigued and make me more likely to not be at peace in that circumstance. But if I'm looking at my work and approaching every task that I'm faced with from the perspective that I've been blessed with this opportunity, Jesus is going to give me the peace here to to do what I need to do exactly as it needs to be done. I'm not going to be able to escape that and 
and I'm looking for his peace actively while I'm doing what I'm doing, then all of a sudden it's a lot easier to, to experience that peace, even when the circumstances around you aren't peaceful. And my, oh my, is it really easy to be the peaceful one in today's society because people freak out about almost everything, almost everything that doesn't go the way they like it. So I think for us, there's, there's a major opportunity for us, especially as Christians in the world to not be tied to our circumstances, but to actually realize where our help comes from, where that peace can be attained and how to attain it by focusing on Jesus in every single task that we partake in. You know, the saying that this generation's getting worse or life is getting worse by the day. You know what I mean? Do you know, do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. 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 It's kind of funny because the amount of times I've heard that there was this, there was, there was this elderly man at the church that I kind of just had a great conversation and he got, and he kind of points this out. He goes, you know, back in when I was a kid, my dad and my parents and my great grandparents, and even the elder people at that time always said uh, that, that the, this generation's getting worse. So it's just funny. Cause like, you know, I feel like deep down, like, like, you know, people are like, I'm losing peace. You know, I think deep down, like we've, oh, we've never had true peace because we never actually took the time to actually be connected to the one who's the king of all peace. Does it make sense? Ooh, that's kind of, that's kind of messed up, <laughs> but, it, but it's true. Am I wrong? Like I think deep down, dude, and this is so interesting because I've experienced this in March. Where like I went, so I was like working my butt off in in the month of March. We we stopped podcasting. I went to Cancun to spend time with my family. I remember that you had that episode with I think Nate, right? Um, Wasn't Nate? You know who uh, I'm talking about? Jack. Jack. Yeah, great episode mm-hmm. by the way. Shameless plug. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, but like um, but like deep down, like we're just gonna throw it out there like i was having a lot of family problems like i was trying really hard to like spend time connect with them and uh thanks to you man like thanks for for opening that for me because you know you took over you took over you let me not worry about it i was stressing about that like thanks for doing that just to kind of like let you know but like uh i was in the most i think we talked about this too but like i was in the most beautiful place in cancun the most beautiful beaches the most beautiful views and yet I didn't find a sense of peace. And I think deep down, like we as people tend to buy, try to buy peace or try to buy joy too. We also try to buy joy and peace. And those are the only two things I've noticed. Why? Because if you want to have fun, let's go to Elitch's Gardens for 50 bucks for a day of like having fun, spending like a hundred dollars, you know, or like, you know, oh, like I want to experience true joy. I want to experience like, you know, I want to go to a place that's super calm, isolated so I can be by myself, you know? And So I'm going to spend like $10,000 to go travel the world. Like, you know, with the right intentions. Yeah. You'll be happy. You'll find like, you'll find what you're looking for. But, um, pretty soon, like, I think deep down, like we're chasing a high that just can't, or, or we're trying to fill a hole that just can't be filled. You know what I mean? Mm. And I think deep down, like that's, that's why it's so important to like genuinely tie yourself down to the Lord. You know, it's why um, I find that like when I, when I'm depressed or when mental illness has come, uh, what is it? There's this sense of like calmness. Exactly. Like uh, I've said this before. I can't remember where I said it, but I feel like when we say like Jesus, oh Lord Jesus, just saying Jesus's name is like a VIP ticket to like peace. Like, you know, no other name has that. I can't say Chris. Because it doesn't come with peace. You know what I mean? I can't just say like, oh, Chris, That's you know? Him. No, like, oh, like Chris. Genuinely, say, genuinely saying like, oh, Lord Jesus, like, thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross. Thank you so much. Like, just saying it throughout my day, even just saying the words, like, brings peace. It's weird. It's so weird. But I, I challenge anybody who's listening to try it out because um, it's brought me so much peace, you know? Like, it's brought me, like, when, when life gets go- gone, like, you know, like some people go, Jesus Christ, it's stressful, you know? <laughs> yes. Am I, am I wrong though? Like, but I think deep down, it just goes back to the whole, like we as people try to buy, like we try so hard to buy joy and peace in areas that it, to try to fill a hole that just can't be filled, that only God can fill. It's just interesting in my opinion that like even someone like that, where you can see God's miracles and still not, not feel that feel that void fulfilled until you actually hear his voice or actually like have an encounter with him, like a genuine encounter. Um, mind if I like switch, switch gears for a little bit. 
Absolutely. Go I'm ahead. What's on the mind? Matthew. It's just um, I kind of want to pick your brain. I want to pick your brain on one thing. And I and I don't know if uh, has Matt reached out to you by chance. Just curious. <laughs> the actual Matthew that's alive in this day Matt, and age. <laughs> Matt Brick. Matt Brick. Uh, yeah. Shameless plug. Matt Brick. Brickhouse podcast. Big fan over here. <laughs> <laughs> that's a great plug. He has not. Why? Oh, because like he asked me a question about why we baptize people in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I knew it related to the Trinity. I genuinely knew it related to the Trinity. But the problem is, is that like because I struggle so hard to understand that concept of like even just talking about the trinity with people is a hard concept in itself same goes when the level of like sovereignty versus free will brings a lot of faith to a lot of people and so it wasn't until i read this commentary that i really thought it was super super interesting because it relates to baptism obviously when you baptize somebody you baptize them in the father son and the holy spirit that's why Mm -hmm. we say that because you know the lord is the father son and the holy spirit but this um this chapter kind of points it out in Matthew how like chapter three talks about like the father aspect. Chapter 12 talks about the son aspect. And then chapter like, I want to say like somewhere in chapter, maybe like one or two talks about like the Holy spirit aspect, you know, like it's literally like sprinkled in on what the father, what the son, what the Holy spirit is and how it all connects. So that way, when you get to the uh, crucifixion, you see that transgression and that like, where like Christ and Jesus, or I mean, Jesus and God kind of become one, you know, and the spirit is allowed to like fulfill onto everyone, you know, overflow onto everyone. At least that's how it kind of understands it. Different people kind of say that like the father, son, and the Holy spirit is like basically saying the father represents the old Testament. The son represents the new Testament and the Holy spirit is what helps us, you know, understand the tension between both, you know, like there's so many ways to understand this Trinity aspect, but like, what do you think? So, the God of the Old Testament came down in flesh. Who, that's who Jesus is. And then the Holy Spirit is the spirit of God that you see at specific instances in the Old Testament under the Old Covenant now poured out on all um, who are, are God's people. So, I mean, I think we say all three of them at the same time when we're talking about baptism because that is that is the entirety of the God that we worship, right? He's not just God. His name isn't God. He has many different names and that speaks to the entirety of his character. He's got just, I mean, that's a song I think by Phil Wickham, isn't it? Like a thousand names. It's like, yeah, yeah. God calling God, God is not doing him a service, right? He, God is such a generic name and he's so much more than that. The way he relates to us in all these different ways as our provider, as our healer, as the creator of all, as the Messiah, as God with us, Emmanuel, right? So I think we say all three at the same time to try and, and just demonstrate the entirety of his perspective and his character as we experience it um, here on earth. What was very interesting for me is the fact that like, I didn't catch this until Reese, until that, until I saw some of the commentaries where it goes like Matthew and John are the only two areas where we technically see uh, John talk, uh, where they both talk about the Trinity or the divine Trinity of God. Um, I'll read a little bit of the passage just now where it says, especially in chapters 14 through 16, where it constitutes constituting of the kingdom, where like Jesus basically saying the kingdom of heaven looks like this and this kingdom of heaven looks like this and this. He kind of sprinkles sprinkles in the divine trinity behind it. But mainly Matthew discloses the reality of the divine trinity by giving a name uh, as giving the name one name for three for all three. Um, Basically, in the opening chapters, he talks about the Holy Spirit in 118 talks about Christ the Son in 118, and then from there, he talks about God the Father in 123. So the first chapter genuinely talk, uh, at least opens the conversation up. It's kind of interesting because when, like I said, as I was reading Matthew, when it came to this aspect, especially when I was reading the kingdom, the kingdom parables, it talks about like the, it kind of gives reference to how like the church and Jesus have that relationship, or at least an idea of what the depiction of the church he's looking for. And it kind of me- mentions this like evolution over time. I wish I can go back to my notes to like talk about it, but I have to <laughs> have to look for them. If you, if anybody mm-hmm. wants me to go more into that of like um, kind of like Jesus kind of even talks about like a depiction of what the church looks like, how like it goes from Judaism to, uh, to uh, what is it? The church in acts and how he even predicts how acts is supposed to show up, you know, at the same time, um, I kind of find it interesting just because of the fact that we're mainly going into Matthew and we could talk about this all day. Um, 
I find it funny how like when Jesus gets resurrected, he goes back to Galilee. He doesn't go straight to Jerusalem. And I don't know about you, man, because we both know that Jesus' ministry starts in Galilee, right? Mm -hmm. So part of me sees it as a way of like, you know, him kind of like abandoning the Judaism, like, you know, religiousness perspectives and taking on the new covenant, you know, basically leaving behind the old and entering into a new, entering into the new, you know, allowing salvation into all his people, even from the lowest of lows. I think that, that when we're talking about God's people, right, we, we see a really kind of subtle image of what that looks like with the interaction that Jesus has uh, with that woman, oh, I don't remember exactly what the case was. I think her son was demon possessed or something like it. And she was calling out to him. She was a Canaanite, so she wasn't a Jew, was part of God's quote unquote chosen people. Um, but she calls out to Jesus nonetheless, and Jesus ignores her the first go around. And the disciples, because Jesus ignored her the first go around, uh, tell him, Hey, can you tell her to stop complaining? It's like, just she's being too loud, she's being too noisy, or something like it. And, and Jesus ends up engaging her after that. I, for, I don't, it doesn't, I don't remember exactly what the transition was, but he ends up engaging her after that. And uh, you see an interesting picture take place there uh, because he says after the disciples complain to him that I haven't come for everyone. Uh, I've, I've only come for the people that God sent me for. And yet you see this Canaanite woman who apparently initially appears as if she's not uh, one of those people that he's come for, but then he engages her in conversation and he says something along the lines of like uh, the children's bread is not supposed to be given to the dogs to her mm. to kind of demonstrate that perspective. Like, Hey, I haven't come for everybody. My words are for the people that I came here for. And she responds very cleverly. And she says, she says, mm. this is true, but the dogs also eat the crumbs that fall off the master's table. And after she says that Jesus says, your faith is amazing go yeah, and no. your son will be healed along that. And I found that very interesting because I think that's the first time we actually sort of see that transition that you were kind of talking about towards that, that new covenant where we, we don't just get the picture that the Israelites are God's only chosen people, but God has also chosen people from his elect who are Gentiles. And that's a very interesting picture that we see there with that Canaanite woman who demonstrates great faith for someone who is not an Israelite, who is not a Jew. It goes back to the whole, like your faith has healed you. You know, I think like, I don't know. This is just my thought. Okay. <laughs> just a thought, you know, but I feel like it's the same depiction as, um, from Matthew nine, where Jesus basically heals the sick woman, the one who's been bleeding for like 12 years. I feel like both have the same exact like parallels. Does it make sense where you, what you're saying, you know? Where it's mm. like, on one aspect, it's a verbal parallel. You know, we see verbal confirmation of like verbal faith, right? And then the next one, we see faith put into action. So mm. like when it came to your perspective of that woman who basically says, even the even even the breadcrumbs, even the dogs eat out of the breadcrumbs. And they, remember, when, he, when Jesus says like, hey, like I only give bread to those who are willing, right? He's referencing that he's the living, like he's, he's the bread. Like I give myself to my chosen people, which is basically the Jews, right? We agree. Like, you know, at least that's what that picture, or at least what theologians believe that's what he was referencing, you know? At that point that, in time. And, yeah. At that point in time, Gentiles are basically, basically like, you know, the Gentile at least was like being so true that even the Gentiles want to take part of this promise. You know, even Gentiles are willing to take up whatever the Lord is willing to provide for them. Towards the end, when Jesus gets, gets, uh, uh, I think it's Matthew 27 or 26 or 27, 26, um, where we talk about like Bethany, Mary, Mary of Bethany, you know, literally mm -hmm. buys an expensive perfume. We see it in Luke and John, the three different perspectives of how basically it's a year's worth of wages. That's about $70,000 for, inflation slash uh today's culture a perfume that's worth 70 grand do you know mm. how much money i would do with that i would buy a ferrari i'd buy the new <laughs> corvette stingray man i would buy, i'm just letting you know where my brain is at with that kind of money uh -huh. you could buy a 2020 2024 corvette stingray 6.4 <laughs> liter horsepower sorry not to no oh, beautiful <laughs> but everyone's like, no, dream you can, you can buy that, but she came from the poor of the poor. And literally you see this, you see this happen where she basically anoints Jesus on her burial. Right. And instead, like even like the disciples, the disciples criticize her and basically says, why didn't you spend this 
on um what is it why didn't you spend this for like jesus mm -hmm. ministry and jesus uh -huh. kind of corrects them and goes or takes them as an opportunity to like correct them and say actually guys like what she did she gave me everything she had she could have used it to live a prosperous life and yet she gave it all to me and because of that i'm gonna make her known I'm going to glorify her. And in Acts, she actually does get glorified. Why? Because she gets used as another example. Mm -hmm. So I think it's so amazing. Not only that, but like we also see another aspect in Mark or Luke, where basically a woman does the same thing, an expensive perfume, but that literally washes her tears and her and uses her hair to wash Jesus' feet. And the Pharisees do the same exact thing where they go, if he only knew what that woman's been through or what that woman is, or what kind of woman is washing her feet. And Jesus sees it and protects her. I don't know why, but like something about like, like specifically with finances. I don't want to go into it because if we go into that part, it's going to get, um, we're going to be here for like another hour. But like something about like just laying it all down, like the personal finance, just basically saying like nothing belongs to me. It's exactly what Job says. Nothing belongs to Lee. It all belongs to the Lord. Having that like mentality and just being genuine about it, you know? The Lord will like provide. Why do you think like Jesus even says like, look at the birds. They don't worry because their father is going to provide for them. If God provides for them, what makes you think he's not going to do the same for you? Mm -hmm. Um, Look at the heart posture of David for a certain example. Oh man. Why am I always going back to those people? I keep going back to like, <laughs> uh, I'm love try to use a little bit too examples. much. Yeah. A little too much, but I'll use different examples, but um, who else can I use? We could use, ah, oh, man. We could use Paul, for example, just because I want to throw it out, change it up. No, David, no, David. But we could use Paul, for example, like literally living day off of day, you know, literally like mm -hmm. knowing that the Lord's going to provide, knowing the Lord's going to provide for him wherever he goes. Even it's why uh, Paul even says like, you know, I'm both rich in Christ and poor in Christ, you know, like, you know, I've learned to have everything. I've learned to have everything good and everything bad happen. But I know one thing is consistent is like my faith towards Christ in Philippians is always going to be consistent. We also see it with the disciples when he first sends them out. Don't take anything with you. No money, no nothing. Wherever you go, wherever you stay, they're going to feed you. They're going to take care of you. And, um, you know, if they don't take you in, then like wipe the dust off your feet, go somewhere else. But like, you know, just know there's a hot cup of chow waiting for you in the next city, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. Jesus sometime probably. <laughs> I think that a good takeaway from this discussion involves just making sure that we're not tying ourselves to our circumstances, right? And making sure mm -hmm. that we can attain God's peace regardless of the actual circumstance that we are in. And understanding that he is the God who is in the chaos that he initially created, but calls order out of. And that anytime we find him in the midst of that chaos, we're in a good spot. So I think practically, what does that look like in comparison to what the world will tell you? Like we said, the world will tell you, hey, do your best to make sure that your practical circumstances are as peaceful as possible. Value those and find meaning in those circumstances, right? And the call for Christians is almost completely the opposite. It's like your circumstance doesn't matter. We're in the world. We are not of the world. Find the peace that Jesus has brought, the spiritual peace that Jesus has brought, because he has not come to bring practical peace. He came to bring a sword. And that sword is going to be felt by the people of the world who only see life through that practical perspective, the circumstance emphasized perspective. So I think for us, as we're doing life and we're trying to find purpose in the midst of our day-to-day -day reality and our routine, I think finding that peace in Jesus and fixing our eyes on him in every single thing we do, not just sort of charging up the peace meter uh, is really going to be important for us. If we want to carry that spiritual peace that Jesus has brought us throughout our lives and do our best to stay in alignment with him in every aspect uh, that we can. Trying to find peace. It's just something that, is hard to obtain because it's easier said than done. You know, it's why um, I think just holding on and like, like you said before, keeping your eyes on Jesus and just keeping it straight, like keeping that mind of being like, all right, Lord, where are you at in this midst of chaos? So I can focus on you is, um, is something that like genuinely like takes time and practice um, for me, man, like certain something I'm currently do like learning to do is learning to plan. 
and learning to let God lead or trying to let God lead me, you know? And so, uh, I'll, like, this is where we can pick it up next week and I can tell you all about it. But, um, per, I'm reading James and it says all about like, if it's in God's will, this will happen. If it's in God's will, like, um, certain things will happen, you know? Or like, you know, the Lord will let certain things happen, you know? And I think deep down, I like, I've always said that with you, buddy. But I think for me personally, I'm trying really hard to dissect that and be like, all right, Lord, what do you really mean by that? You know? And something that I learned recently yesterday is um, when it comes to making decisions, you know, I think of like, you know, seek wise counseling, highly recommend seeking wise counseling. Um, what is it? Pray about it. Pray about it continually. If you can like pray about it, at least like be like, Lord, like, where are you at? Like uh, I asked that like you, you, you like my path, you know, figure out where, where like, Lord, uh, pick the directions that you want me to be. I want you to be a part of every decision if possible, you know? And then from there, uh, find it scripturally, find some sort of scripture that you can rely on and be like, all right, Lord, this is where I feel like you're pulling me, or this is the scripture I'm using for confirmation, you know? And finally make a choice. I think, um, pray before you plan. I think that's such a good mentality is just pray, then plan pray and plan because let God be the like the dictator of that decision. So I think when it comes to finding peace, it's just like, and, and the reason why I'm saying I'm relating it to like making choices is because of the fact that like we as people are thrown with so many choices. Like you can go down the grocery aisle list of the cereal box because I just had a good cereal of cinnamon toast crunch, 100%. Cereal toast crunch, feel free to, to sponsor me. Um, you know, um, no, seriously, you like see Fruit Loops, you see all these different styles of like, of like, uh, what is it, cereals, and you're like, which one has the most sugar? Which one has the least sugar? Which one's the most healthiest? Which one can I not eat? And you're kind of like overwhelmed with choice, right? And you're like, Lord, where are you at in the cereal? You know what I mean? There's not a box that says Jesus included, you know, <laughs> like Jesus toy included. So I genuinely think just being like, Lord, like, I just asked that genuinely, like, I want you to be a part of this cereal choice. And Lord, um, wherever you feel like you, I feel that tug, Lord, um, I'm going to trust that it's you and I'm going to follow through. And it's always cereal, cinnamon toast crunch. It's hundred percent the best cereal ever. You can fight me on that in the comment section. Um, <laughs> hashtag such as life pod. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, something about like just sticking to it, just trusting that God's all, all in it because like you chose to let him be a part of it. There's like the, uh, like we can go into the decision-making, which is like open door theology, you know, green light theology. We can go into that and um, certain aspects, but I know that we're kind of running out of time. So that sounds like a next week question, maybe. I don't know. It's up to you. But mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that's that's where my thoughts is. is like always try to find God God's peace in areas that you least expect it. You'd be surprised. And at the same time, um, bear on one another. Like let somebody else also give you that, their sense of peace. Something about like, you know, when your faith is down and you tell somebody else that like you're having doubts or you're struggling to find God in this midst, something about them pouring on to you bring lifts up your faith. It's like almost saying like, Hey bro, I know you're going like, Hey Chris, I know you're, you're struggling with your faith. Take some of mine so you can get through the situation. Take on my faith so we can get through it together. Thank you all for listening to this episode. This was a good discussion. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. Oh, it was fun. kind of, it was very uh, in scripture today, which is, which is actually fun. And it's, it's getting to the <laughs> literal root of the issues. So that was good. I enjoyed it. See y'all next week. Peace See out. See you next week, guys. We love you. Spirit letting people driven. That's just how it is. I stay standing in the pocket. Ain't afraid to take the hits. I'm an operator under spirit cover moving slick. Ain't no tricks. This a treat. Sweet like cocoa with a mix.